Thank you. <laughs> so um, I think that the comments that I want to make here today really highlight the extent to which I believe that the political culture and everything that flows from it in the particular uh, immigrant diaspora receiving society has a profound effect on what happens thereafter. I'm going to be discussing and drawing on three studies that I've uh, done over the past 15 years. I want to concentrate on the most recent one I've been doing, with also, also with uh, Generation 1.5 uh, Canadian Somali youth. Um, but I want to begin with uh, a series of interviews that I did in 1995 in London and Toronto comparing the communities because the conclusions are foundational. Um, it's not very often that you have an opportunity to compare, as I did, integration in two different communities that are five to seven years old and have arisen for the same reasons with the same folks from the same uh, socioeconomic groups, etc. And I spoke to the better part of a hundred uh, people, roughly half in each, in each uh, city. The question I was asking was, what did they choose to hang on to as they moved into diaspora? What was the key thing that was important to them? And in both cities, the answer resoundingly was religion. But it's important to recognize that it was not more of what they had done before. This was a movement led overwhelmingly by women. Um, and it's and for two reasons. The first is that everybody who moved into the diaspora was traumatized. They had seen terrible things happen to people. They had experienced terrible things themselves. And um, for many, many, many people described to me how many women described how in those five uh, daily prayers, that was the only time that there was solace and peace in, um, in, in uh, a sort of respite from what they were dealing with emotionally. But most importantly, they were terrified to lose their children. If I heard that phrase once, I heard it a hundred times. Lose their children to an alien religion or worse than that, more frighteningly than that, no religion. So they needed to be able to tell them what it was to be Somali, what it was to be Muslim, and first they had to articulate that for themselves. Um, they didn't trust the Islamists. There were small Islamist groups that had become, that had begun as political dissidents in Somalia and had moved into various Arab countries before coming, uh, and North African countries before coming to um, the West. They didn't trust them because it, the political Islam that they preached didn't sit well with these women, but on top of that, they thought, suspected them of having clan biases, and that was the last thing they needed. So they decided to do it themselves. They formed study circles, uh, they practiced ijtihad, independent reasoning, in deciding how to live in the West as Muslims. They became, um, they redefined this practice of Islam. They began to wear the hijab instead of the gauzy scarves they might have worn before, pray more assiduously, attend Friday prayers, get their teenagers to do the same, much to the disgruntlement, I will tell you, of those teenagers whom I talked to as well. And um, it, it extended across many areas. I don't have time to go into that now, but one of them was the area of female cutting. This was a widespread practice back home when they read the Quran, recognized that it was not a Muslim practice, but a Somali cultural practice. They stopped doing it pretty much immediately. And I want to emphasize it was because of their turning to religion and certainly not because Canada and the UK had passed legislation specifically making it illegal. So these things were happening in both cities, but it quickly became apparent to me that there were major differences in how they were being expressed. In both cities, they, dis they were encountering racism and Islamophobia. But in Toronto, person after person said to me, you know, there is a space for me to be both Somali and Canadian. Being Somali and Canadian, they're not a contradiction. And being Somali is one way of being um, Canadian. But in the UK, again and again I was hearing, if you live here for, you know, people were saying that if you live here for 10 generations, you are never going to be British and you're never really going to be long. And these had profound repercussions for how these things affected them. So, for instance, when a woman um, in Toronto wore the jilbab, the long hijab or the hijab, she would say, I'm expressing my Somaliness. Whereas a London woman would tend to tell me, when I put this on and I go downtown on Oxford Street, I'm basically saying, screw you. Who the hell are you to tell me that I'm not as good as you, that I can't live here, that I can't belong here? So a real sense of anger in the UK that wasn't here. 
had other repercussions as well, but the real red flag for me was in the different sense of connection to society. In Canada, I was hearing things like a real um, concern about politics. Who's going to be elected? Who's going to be more interested in my interests? Who's going to take me more seriously? Um, I had a number of people say, I need to learn French now. Why do you need to learn French? Because I've already learned English, and French is another, you know, uh, Canada's other official language. It's really important. In the UK, I was hearing, I don't care what goes on in politics. It's not going to make any difference to me. A real sense of alienation and separation from the wider community. And um, fast forward, 15 years later, those cracks have become a chasm. While I haven't done formal research on this, every time I talk to a community leader who comes to Canada, they're astonished at the differences. When young people that I talk to talk, go to the UK to visit relatives, they come back and say, oh my gosh, you can't believe the difference. They are so, they just, it's like they're not integrated over there, and they use that wording. Um, just a brief note from interviews I did with women in Regent Park 10 years later. Integration is continuing. Regent Park, of course, is a social housing project in Toronto. Women living there were terrified of the violence. This is why they left Somalia. They didn't want to take their kids into it. They described being Canadian as forming, um, as allying with other moms from different uh, ethnic and religious backgrounds, something they once upon a time would never have seen themselves doing to keep their kids safe, to protect them. And there were huge changes that they described in parenting styles. I talk to my kids, I never used to do that, etc. So the Somali youth that I've been talking to are also Generation 1.5, born back home, but for the most part, almost all of them arrived in Canada before they started school. So they were socialized in Canada. And I've asked them the three questions that you see here. When I ask them what it means to be Somali, to them, I get various, uh, various uh, answers around religion, language, food, poetry, particularly strongly, question of telling stories, and very much so a network of people who know where you belong and how, and how you fit in. Fascinatingly, when I ask them what does it mean to you to be Canadian? They do not say to me, it means you're white and like hockey and drink Tim Hortons coffee. They have a variety of answers and they sort of wander around for a bit, but almost to a person. And regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of whether they're in school or not, regardless of whether they're religious or not, and uh, regardless of whether they're male or female, they will say in some form being Canadian means being able to respect somebody even if you don't agree with that person. I think this is really profound and I think it has profound implications not just for how they interact and, and act in Canadian society but also in terms of if it can be harnessed carefully how they see back home and how they see res resolving the back home conflict. This does not mean, however, that everything is perfect. These kids encounter huge barriers based on class, racism, and or Islamophobia. And interestingly, these barriers are gendered. Girls are tending to do really well. Girls are going on to post-secondary, whether it's university or college. And they're aware that their moms are goddesses. They're powerhouses. And they, even if they don't know exactly what the terrible things their moms went through, because the moms won't talk about them in detail, they're aware that they've come through fire for them, and these girls aren't going to let them down. It's more complicated for the boys for two reasons. One is that um, when their dads came, not only did they encounter, uh, not only had they lived through the same trauma back home, but coming to Canada, we let them in as refugees, but we didn't help them retrain, so that they lost dignity as well as... Um, as well as, as, as everything that they had, had lost from back home. And, and so the jobs that were available, security guard, parking lot attendant, were not the kind of status providing jobs they'd have back home. And it was a really demoralizing experience. And many men were, were, were quite crushed by it. And I argue that, yes, there were a lot of single mother households, but at the same time, even when there were dads, they weren't able to be the same role models uh, that the, the women were. And this has had a profound effect on kids. The other issue is that while we do a lot of things well in creating a socially just diverse society in this country, we do an absolutely terrible job of keeping young black boys in school and we really have to figure out how to fix that. 
Another couple of things that were important that came through in this set of interviews, everybody needs to feel a sense of belonging. Identity is a big concern for anyone who's diasporic, and I don't care if back home is Scotland, or England, or Ireland, or France, or Pakistan, or Somalia, we all need to feel a sense of connection to back home as well as to here. It's kind of what grounds us, and inherently, there is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing problematic in it. It's what being diasporic is all about. Providing that, you also are, feel that you belong in the adoptive society. We also all want to live meaningful lives. We want to feel we can make a difference. And whether that's within our families or our communities here or in the uh, wider society that we're in now or back home, we want to feel that we can do that. And so we need to be able to have the tools to be able to do that. There have been a handful of young Somali men who've got trapped in what I call the misguided romanticism of radicalism in the guise of al-Shabaab. Um, and there have been others who've decided that they can make it rich, which is another way of finding acceptance by, you know, becoming drug mules for some gang in Fort McMurray. Both of them have had tragic consequences. I don't think that it needs to be the beginning of a trend, but I think we have to realize that they're manifestations of ways that we as the wider society have actually failed young Somali boys in not being able to engage them and not being able to, to, uh, to, to, to deal with all the issues that, that uh, Steve was talking about. There is a clear lesson that runs through this. Belonging to the adoptive home is going to be enhanced enormously when that home is inclusive and when, critically, the barriers are eradicated to complete participation, and I mean complete participation, in economic, political, and social spheres. In Canada, the Somali community is not inclined to embrace extremism as a, in any form. Somali parents went through hell getting their kids out of that violent place, and the last thing they want is for any one of their kids to go back there into that inferno. But we can help them and support them by making sure that we do eradicate whatever barriers stand in their way. And if you come to the roundtable, I do have all kinds of ideas about um, how to go about doing this. Policy implications, um, again, best way to ensure that newcomers are connected is to eradicate these barriers and to recognize that integration is not a question of asking people to get rid of old loyalties and only embrace their new country. That's just not how people work. It is a question of weaving and it is a question of of understanding that that weaving takes time and is in fact a bargain and a trust relationship between um, folks who are coming and the wider society that's embracing them. Uh, newcomers will tend to be more respectful if they themselves uh, feel respected. And this is the kind of critical takeaway here. I think we need to understand what we are doing well, and I think we need to articulate it more clearly, if anything. We need to go way beyond tolerance. I don't know anybody who wants to be tolerated, and I don't think that you do either. This is, a, the notion of tolerance is something that drives my students, and not just the Somalis, but all my second generation students, round the bend. They don't want to be tolerated, they want to be accepted for who they are and for the good things that they bring, and in return, they will open up and accept. I think we need to articulate what we're doing in as wise a way as the Somali youth I've been interviewing. And I think ultimately we need to take away and remember um, as policymakers and practitioners that we need, if anything, more inclusion, not less. And I have one last thing to say, a note to David Cameron, and this is actually um, borrowing from the Princess Bride here. I don't think that word means what you think it does. Multiculturalism, you've never tried it. And it doesn't actually mean bringing people in, leaving them alone, ignoring them. It means bringing down the barriers to participation. It's the only way you can create socially just, diverse societies. And that is the safest way to protect against radicalization and other social problems. Thank you.